All right, hi everybody. Uh, sometimes I thought about trying to get a PhD so I could say hi everybody, cause I'm then I'd be Doctor Nick, like in The Simpsons. But that's a very expensive proposal just to be able to do that. So, hi everybody. Upon request, we're going to do a little bit about shakuhachi acoustics today. Okay. good sometimes before they talk too much about shakuhachi to just play it a little bit. That's how you can figure the most out about what's going on, right? And for me it's really been a matter more of an art than a science and I think that's appropriate for this. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about shakuhachi acoustics, how all that works. Behind me you can see my modern art doors. <laughs> These are old style Japanese doors with kind of panes of glass and I put colored panels in the glass as they break. So we've got a nice kind of uh, modern art design now, which which I enjoy. And I'm borrowing my daughter's chalkboard for today's discussion, so thanks to them as well. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about kind of two big things. Number one, we're going to talk about the Giotti Shakuhachi, right? This is something that I've studied myself as well, the modern Giotti Shakuhachi, um, and how the acoustics work in that. And then we're going to talk about the Edo era Jinashi, okay? The, uh, this is kind of my specialty, this is where I live um, in that world, and what's different about the acoustics in that case, okay? So, but we're going to start with the modern flute, just because it's interesting to compare them, okay? So here we've got a modern shakuhachi, this is a uh, gyoksan, right? The gyoksui's son or something like that made this, and uh, I had to repeat it a little bit, but it's working well now. Alright, so there's lots of differences between modern and ancient shakuhachi, but we're going to work with this first, okay? So, what's going on? How does this make a sound? The first thing that we should know is... Right here you go, you've got the shakuhachi, you've got your taguchi, your mouthpiece here. You can see that okay, right? You've got your mouthpiece here, and then here's, this is going to be a weird drawing, but here's you. And here's your lips. Alright, we'll move this up a little bit. There we go. And there's the blowing edge there, by your lips. We'll give you a nose and an eye there. And some crazy hair, yeah. Wow, you look weird. <laughs> That's cool. All right, and when you're blowing, when you're blowing here, here's what's happening. You've got some air going, and your air is hitting this, right? Some of the air, in any case, some of the air is going inside, some of it's going outside. But what happens when your air is going on the blowing edge, right? You've got some air kind of coming out here, some coming out here. And since it's split, you've got a one area with lower pressure and one area with higher pressure, okay? So let's say this area on top is lower pressure, okay? I'll make this a little bit bigger now so you can see it. So again, here's your lips. Just kind of some strange lips there. I'll give you a nose too. And here's your air, and here's the blowing edge. This is the inside of the flute here keeps sinking down on me. That's not helpful. There we go. So, let's say your air is going here. This area ends up being lower pressure than this, right? Because it can't be perfectly divided in two. There's always going to be a little bit more on the outside or a little bit more on the inside. And what's going on is that when this area is lower pressure, that's going to create kind of some suction, right? A little bit of a vacuum force. And the stream of air is going to want to kind of drift up this way. Right? As that happens, now this area becomes lower pressure, so the stream of air is going to want to drift back down this way. And that sets up this kind of vibrating, pulsing pressure wave right here that creates a standing wave in the flute. So you've got this kind of high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, right? And, you know, the people talk about, uh, are you sotobuki or uchibuki, right? Some people prefer to play more inside the flute, more outside of the flute. The, probably the way, the reason that people feel that way is that 
in your airstream, right, you've got kind of this lower pressure area here, but then you've got the fastest parts going on either edge. And these are actually the parts of the airstream that you use, right? So some people tend to go blowing inside more, and they use this part of the airstream, or people who feel like they're blowing more outside the fluid are using this part of the airstream. Um, you know, different techniques for different things. When people play a Giardi flutes, they might want to play this way, but if you play a, an older style flute, you really have got to get the air kind of inside the flute, or you've got to play a little bit merry for things to work well. So, again, there's many different reasons for people's preferences, of course. Alright, so, you've got this standing wave happening. you got the standing wave, okay? So, let's draw the whole shakuhachi this time. Draw it really simple there. Here's the blowing edge, okay? Here's the top, there's the bottom. And going along the shakuhachi, let's say we're playing Ro. Alright, you've got these vibrations being set up here. That's creating this sort of pressure wave, a standing wave and your air is, um, basically this column of air inside the flute is vibrating, okay? Now as it's vibrating, um, you have a sort of wave. If we look at it in terms of a sine wave, it's going to look something like this. Right, so you've got this kind of standing wave going on. Right, and you can see that the wave is also extending past the flute, right? In in case in the case of the uh, the roll, the end is here, but the actual vibrating air is actually vibrating a little bit longer than the flute. So it's you know you don't have a 54.5 centimeter long column of air vibrating. It's actually plus maybe two or three centimeters, right? It's not an immediate like you know this air is vibrating and bam, this air is not. You've got sort of a diffusion effect going on there. So the practical length of the vibrating column of air is going to be a little bit longer than the flute. And you can see you've got this kind of sine wave representation of what's going on. If we want to represent it inside the shakuhachi in terms of pressure, which is what's more helpful for me to think about, we can kind of think that, well, this is low pressure here, and then at this point in the wave you've got sort of this high pressure node, right? And then as we go towards the end, it's low pressure again, right? So you've got a sort of concentration of pressure right in the middle there. And that is what's allowing this standing wave to vibrate at this particular frequency, okay? So let's think about that on the Giotti Shakuhachi. So, you've got some, you know, the force of my breath here, you've got the force of the standing air on the other side, and then you've got this kind of vibrating column of air, while some of the air is moving a little bit, actually towards the center, the air is actually still, it's sort of like, uh, you know those clackers, you ever seen those things go clack, 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 the stuff in the middle is transmitting force, but it's actually standing still. And that seems to be what's happening with the air inside the shakuhachi as well. So, towards the center, you've got this high pressure node. Alright? So. Alright, so what happens, right, since we've got a high pressure node, so somewhere around the fourth or the fifth hole, depending on the shakuhachi, depending on the type, um, We've got this high pressure node here. So what happens if we let some pressure out? What's going to happen then? Have you ever tried that? You know, if you want to play the higher row, this is an easier way to do it. You can take the fourth hole, or the fifth hole, and lift it up just a crack. Right, let's see what happens when we do that. That's with the fourth hole, right? Now let's move the fifth hole. The same thing should happen. Right, 
actually the fourth hole works um, the best in Giotti Shakuhachi, I think, but the point is that when we take this area where the high pressure node is and make it so a high pressure node can't form, right, letting some air out and that's less pressure, we can't have a high pressure node here anymore, the tone changes, all right? So what happens when we do that? Let's take a look. I'm going to erase this in here. And we'll erase this here. Okay. Oh, I wish this would stand still. Oh, I wish this would stand still. Let me, oh, there we go. Okay. So now what's going on? Before we had a, a pressure node right here in the middle. But now we're going to have two nodes about here and here. So now we've got this going on. And if we represent it again in the shakuhachi, right, we've got kind of less hair. We've got a high concentration up here towards the top, another kind of low pressure area, and then another high pressure area around here, and then low pressure again towards the end. So you've got these sort of high pressure areas here and here happening inside the flute, right? And so that's happening probably somewhere around here and around here, right? about a quarter of the way uh, from either end of the flute, you've got this high pressure node happening again, okay? When we do this. All right, so that's what's happening inside the flute and that's what gives us our changes, right? Because you open this up a little bit or you blow a little bit harder so that it's harder for this single high pressure node to form and then and it splits and you get two high pressure nodes here and because of that high pressure node you notice that it's a uh, higher frequency wave happening now, right? We just had a single wave going wham before but now we've got kind of two sine waves happening so it's a higher frequency and it's a higher octave. So there you go, that's why you have a higher sound happening in the shakuhachi, okay? So, what does this mean for... oh, one, one more thing I should add, okay? The same principle applies if you are playing any of the other notes on the shakuhachi, right? If you're playing tsu, right, opening the first hole, the same thing is happening. It's just that the standing wave is shorter, right? Some of the air is coming out here. The actual vibrating column of air still goes part way down the shakuhachi. It goes past this open hole, right? The hole can't let all the air out at once. It's not like the air suddenly stops vibrating at this point. It goes beyond the hole a little bit and you've got some air above the hole vibrating too. So the practical length of the vibrating column of air is still longer than this end opening of the hole. Uh, same here for, for that. And so on. It's just that the entire system is shorter now, right? So if you're playing that, the bottom two holes are open. You've got your vibrating column of air maybe going right about down to here-ish. Um, and that puts the center, instead of here, a little bit further up the flute, right? And then when you blow into the second octave, bagong, you've got two pressure nodes instead of one. But the same principle applies. So if you know the basics, you can understand what's going on in any note, and even just by looking at the flute, you can kind of make a guess as to about where that high pressure area is happening. So. That's when uh, tuning comes into play, okay? Um, it's going to be a little bit difficult to show you since this is in tune. It would help if I had an out of tune shakuhachi, but, um, or an unbalanced shakuhachi, rather. But uh, there's two things that can happen, okay? So let's go back to Ro and take this entire system. And we're going to talk about low Ro here. Low Ro. So we'll get that back up here for our frame of reference. Our shakuhachi again, our very basic shakuhachi. We've got our wave here. And our high pressure node in the middle. And the low pressure at either side. And the chalkboard that keeps on sliding down on me. That's so annoying. Alright. Noise. So... When you're tuning the shakuhachi, you want the ro to make a sound. There's two things that can happen. One thing that can happen is the ro suddenly jumps.
All right, of course, I'm faking it now, but sometimes you'll get this uh, sound where the row, the low row, won't make a sound. It just wants to jump into the higher octave. What's going on there? Maybe you can guess. All right, the row is jumping up to the higher octave. We've got this high pressure node here that can't form. So instead, it's just skipping this step, and it's making two high pressure nodes here instead of at this spot where it should be doing it. All right. So what does that mean? It means that your pressure here is too low. You need a higher pressure here. All right, and, and when does that happen? Probably what's happening is something like this. If we look at the bore of the shakuhachi, it tends to be something like this. All right, and let's say that fourth and fifth hole is at about this point right here. If this area is too wide, then you're not going to be able to form enough pressure there, right? So if your row is jumping an octave, you've got to find some way of allowing this area to build up some extra pressure. So what do you want to do? Well, make it narrower. You put some junk in here. <laughs> you put some G in here. We're not going to go over that, but you got to make this area a little bit narrower. If it's narrower, it won't be, um, it'll be taking the same vol volume of air but it'll be in a narrower space. So what happens to a larger volume of air if it's in a narrower space? Well, it gets higher pressure. So you've got a high pressure node happening here, and all of a sudden you are able to make the low row again. So, happy birthday, you know? That's great. All right. Now, what if the opposite is happening? What if the opposite is happening? And by the opposite, I mean there's two things that can happen if you blow a little bit more pressure. You can get this sound, let me see, I don't, I don't think it'll do it with this flute, but... Um, the only, I'll just have to explain it. You give it a lot of pressure, and instead of jumping in an octave, it goes... It becomes kind of an unstable sound, and it's rolling or something, right? Um, what is the deal there? If that's the case, it probably means the opposite. For example, and again, I'm, I can't go into every contingency for this. This is just a single explanation. The, of course, this is a complex system, so you might have to do some adjusting at the narrower end of the flute, too. But again, this is just for the sake of understanding the concept of what's going on, okay? So we're not going to be able to explain everything in every contingency. But if it's rolling, you've probably got an area of the flute that is too thin, right? It's too thin, and that um, the, enough air kind of can't come in, right? You don't you don't have enough air coming into the area. So what you've got to do is take a little bit away from here, take away some material, let the air pass through better and it'll stop rolling. Again, on the row, practically speaking, when you've got the rolling effect, it usually actually means that there's not enough air escaping here, and you might need to widen this part too, right? So again, where you have to make the adjustments just is, it depends on what's happening in that particular circumstance. Um, but that's just kind of one basic uh, overview of what is going on with the pressure inside the flute and how that changes, right? Hmm. So let's see, is there anything else we need to explain there? I think that's, I think you should have a pretty good idea of what's going on there at this point. Um, and that's in the case of a Giotti. So, again, with a Giotti Shakuhachi, if the Rho is jumping to a higher Rho, what you actually need to do is make this area a little bit thinner. Right, you kind of choke the air so that there's not so much air going through, and so you can, you, you can build up that high pressure area where you need it to, okay? Um, now, the thing is, with uh, an ancient style shakuhachi, everything changes, because the, the way that we build them is actually quite different from a modern shakuhachi, so you can't take this principle and apply it directly to this, right? By this way of thinking, we would think, like, okay, in my... Uh, my old style shakuhachi. You hear how quiet that is? This is an Edo era shakuhachi. A really nice guy. Um, 
but let's just pretend that this was jumping up too easily to the second octave, which it's not, but um, if it were, what would be going on, right? We might be tempted to think, like, okay, it's jumping up to the second octave, so that means I need to add some material in. Right? And, but that's not what we do. You actually have to take some material away from one of the nodes. And hopefully I can explain why. And again, this part is really just based on my experience. I don't have the complex tools that are necessary to scientifically study and verify this, but I have a pretty good sense, I think, of what's happening inside the flute. So again, this is just based on my experience. This is my sense of things. Uh, if you know anything better, or if you can find anything wrong with what I'm saying, I would love to know about it. Please do let me know. But, all right, let's draw the shakuhachi. Here's your root end. Here's your node. Here's your node. Here's your node, and there's the top. And there's the blowing edge, right? So, Blowing edge, node, 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 and bottom. We've got that all covered. Uh, we have our two holes here, two holes here, and one hole on the back, okay? Now, there is a good reason for the node placement in the shakuhachi. One thing that you'll notice is that, generally on a traditional shakuhachi, you're going to have one, two, three, four chambers. You've got four chambers of air. Each chamber is between the nodes. You'll also notice that they get progressively smaller, right? We've got a larger chamber, then a slightly smaller one, a slightly smaller one, and a slightly smaller one. There's a really good reason for that, because that configuration is the best way to make a stable-sounding flute, right? So that's why ancient, you know, modern shakuhachi, we always have the seven node is kind of the ideal, right? That aesthetic of seven nodes looks really nice. That actually does come from a place. Lots of the older flutes that I've seen don't always have seven nodes. Lots of them, this Edo shakuhachi has only six nodes. The one is filed off, and then the last one is used here. But the very important thing is that it'll have one, two, three, four chambers, which means one, two, three, four, five nodes, at least five nodes. You can see this on pretty much any shakuhachi. And again, like a haiku, it's usually acceptable to put plus or minus one syllable in a, in a haiku, right? So the shakuhachi is sort of similar. The standard is seven, but sometimes people will have eight, sometimes they'll have six, and very rarely there'll be five. On some of the very older flutes, you'll see five nodes as well. This one that I made with just a kind of a scrap of bamboo. That's a five node 2.1. And it works just fine because it has that kind of smaller, larger, larger, larger configuration of chambers happening there, right? And the reason for that is that you're blowing from this end, right? So some force is coming from your air. Um, and that force, of course, diminishes as you get lower. So to maintain an equal pressure in each chamber, you're obviously going to need smaller chambers as you get further away from the origin of your breath. To me, that makes a lot of sense. Um, again... If you can, uh, if you, maybe maybe my understanding is not perfect there, because I'm not a physicist, but that's just my understanding of it. So, we've got our Edo-style shakuhachi, we're blowing into it, we are making this standing pressure wave. The pressure wave, of course, is the same, right? Uh, that's not something that changes. Why am I blurry? Focus. Focus. Hopefully that got it back, okay? So, we've got our shakuhachi. Okay. Blown into it. We're making a sound. And basically, with the air, the same thing is happening. However, when we want to adjust the sound, different things are happening, because we've got sort of a different system happening here. With a jiari shakuhachi, You've got an opening at the end. This is a drawing of the bore. It gets narrower, and then to, as it goes towards the top, it gets wider, right? So you've got this kind of choke around the fourth node, and then it opens up. But basically, all, with all, for all intents and purposes, you only have one pressure chamber, all right? So that ends up being a very complex and sensitive pressure chamber, because if any area is a little bit too narrow or a little bit too wide, and it's going to introduce instabilities into your sound. So you've got to polish it really smooth, and you've got to make sure that taper is even, and that there's not too much variance in it, otherwise you're not going to be able to make a stable sound. Um, now with a Jinashi Shakuhachi, 
we are dealing with the natural bore of the flute. So generally speaking, it's going to look something like this. There's the end, and you've got a node, right? And then the next chamber is a little bit wider, and then you've got a node again. The next chamber is a little bit wider, you've got a node again, and the next chamber is even wider. Right, so you've got this chord of sign of, instead of a gradual slope, you've got this progression in stages of wide, narrow, narrow, narrow. Right, so something similar is happening, but not quite so perfectly. It's happening in a very kind of, well, natural way, natural according to the bamboo anyway. Right, so if you've got a relatively ideal piece of bamboo, it's going to be like this. Again, not every piece of bamboo is ideal, and that's perhaps ideal in itself, because it makes them very interesting. This is what gives each piece its, uh, its unique tone colors and characteristics, and that's why you really need to have a relationship with a piece of the bamboo while you're making it, because you can't just take one formula and apply it to everything. Each piece of bamboo is going to be a little bit different. Maybe this chamber is a little bit too narrow, you know, uh, uh, with respect to the ideal non-existent shakuhachi, right? Or maybe some of it's too wide, or maybe overall it's too wide, or maybe overall it's too narrow, or maybe you don't have much of an opening at the end, or maybe you have a really wide end hole. There's just infinite combinations, and um, again, the the bending of the bamboo. Sometimes the air can't flow straight through. You've got sort of like a, a wavy pattern going on. So you really have to get to know the bamboo and understand how the air is flowing through and um, finding equilibrium as you blow or breathe into it as you play it, right? But that is what's happening. You're got basically setting up the standing wave, and the flute is always looking to maintain equilibrium, right? That's, there's got to be some, there's something kind of nice about that. You know, it doesn't want to have too much pressure in any one part, aside from where the standing wave naturally is going to build up these pressure nodes. So, let's take a breath, and look again at what's happening in the flute. All right, like I said before, with our Giotti example, we've got just one single chamber. And so that everything that happens along here is very sensitive. But the nice thing about the uh, Edo style G Nashi is that you've got one, two, three, four sound uh, chambers of air, okay? And each one of these is seeking equilibrium with the others, right? So it's going to want to maintain um, just an even pressure, like if there's too much air pressure, again, this is, of course, there's going to be high pressure nodes in these standing waves, right? But so that, that standing wave can be kind of uh, naturally formed. It's the air between the, the um, chambers is going to be seeking equilibrium, right? So if there's too much air in one node, it's going to seek to escape. If there's not enough in another node, it's going to try to draw air in, right? So the idea is that you want to kind of maintain this shape and maintain these openings so that you can get equilibrium between each of the chambers as the air is vibrating. So we've got these nodes. We use the nodes to adjust, right? Um, for example, let's say, let's take our first problem, okay? Let's pretend it's always jumping up to the higher octave, okay? Hmm, what's going on there? Like what we learned before, right around here, um, uh, it's not to scale, but this is around the fourth and fifth hole. is more towards the center of the flute, really. But right around here, we've got this kind of high-pressure node. It's trying to form, but it can't form, right? The pressure here is too low. So instead, it's making two nodes here, and it's jumping up to the higher octave, all right? So our problem is low pressure here. If this were a Giotti Shakuhachi, we would want to say, like, oh, okay, well, we need to make that area a little bit thinner so it can form a high pressure node. Um, but that doesn't work here. We don't want to add material, we want to leave the bamboo natural. Um, 
what we're going to do somewhat it might sound a little bit paradoxical at first, but we're going to take some material away from the node that's above it. Right? We're going to make this node just a little bit wider. What does that do? Well, now that the node is wider, think about it this way. I don't know if this is what's actually happening, but it's helping it helpful for me to think about it this way. Um, you've got air going into the flute, right? If this is wider, more air now can go in. But the same amount is escaping, right? So think air in, air out. Before, if this, if this pressure area is too low, you've got more air out than, than air in, right? So air out is too much. We want to let more air in, so we're going to take away some of these nodes. Now we've got more air coming in. In most cases, when that's happening on an Edo era shakuhachi, and you kind of, uh, yeah, Edo style shakuhachi, you take away some material from this node, that will make it so that this area of the flute can actually build up a little bit more pressure, and then you won't have the problem anymore. Again, lots of times it's more complex than that because every time you change one of these nodes, you're actually affecting the interaction of the entire system, right? These chambers between come rel relatively pressurized, but they're all getting a little bit more air, so you might find that you've got some problems down here. You've got to do more adjusting. So each time you're adjusting one of these nodes, you're allowing more into the pre more uh, air into the chamber be beyond it. But you're also affecting the entire system. So you've got to think about the node that you're doing, and you've got to think about the entire system as a whole. Um, it may be that we actually have to open up everything a little bit more, but open this up relatively more for everything to work out. And again, when you've got different circumstances, uh, different measures are necessary. But that's just a basic of what's going on. So the, the, the thing to keep in mind with these is air in, air out, right? How much air is coming in? How much air is able to escape? What is the relative size of those openings of those nodes compared with the um, volume of the chamber, right? Um, does, is this chamber getting too much air, or is it getting not enough air, right? When it's getting not enough air, you're going to find that beep kind of jumping up to the second octave. Uh, if a chamber is getting too much air, however, you're going to hear this rolling sound, um, which, again, I don't think I can do on this one, but... <laughs> just right at just the right angle I can kind of simulate it with this one um, that's actually that this is happening on this flute for a different reason um, but I won't go into that now that's what it sounds like though that v -v 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 right this it kind of sounds like the air can't quite get through so in that case instead of opening the chamber above it you're going to open one of the chambers below the area in question so as to let more air out because you've got too much pressure in there and it's kind of not able to escape quickly enough and it makes that sort of rolling sound. So that's what's going on there. Um, again, this is very simplified. Uh, there's no way to explain every contingency at once, but this should give you a general idea of what is happening inside the shakuhachi, how it makes a sound, how the sound changes, and what you do about that in a giari and a jinashi flute. Now, in the case of the modern Jinashi, this is what separates modern Jinashi from ancient Edo era Shakuhachi, is that modern Jinashi are made just like a Jiyari flute, right? Um, you take the flute, you kind of smooth out the bore, you try to make it so it's got a gradual taper to it as much as possible, and you only worry about maybe, maybe you'll leave in a little bit of material here at the bottom, and if the row is unstable, you end up dripping some putty or something, putting some G in this area and building it up to stabilize that sound. Um, but the interesting thing with modern jinashi is that you do still have the natural texture of the bore. You've got a bore that is not quite ideal and perfect as the modern jinashi, jiari shakuhachi is. And um, you also might have a wider bore or a narrower bore, which also affects the tone color. So there's still several factors that can give you an interesting tone color, but basically the feel of playing a modern Giyari shakuhachi and that sort of a uh, very crisp, clear, loud sound, right? In contrast to the very quiet sound, the sort of mellow and mysterious sound of a uh, ancient style shakuhachi. <laughs> Uh, 
I hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. Have fun with it. Cheers.